News of the Times. Wicked Wednesdays. Fatal Transactions. When the Cash Register Rings Death. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at two cases where the shop owner is targeted, robbed and murdered in rather gruesome ways. Our first case from 1872 takes place in Hoxton and involves a mother and a daughter aged 76 and 48 respectively who are brutally murdered in the middle of the day on a busy street within their stationer's shop. Our second case from 1903 involves the slaughtering of a young family by con artist and serial killer Edgar Edwards who only becomes caught due to his own violent temper. The Essex Leighton mystery was brutal and only came to light due to a curious mixture of events. Shocking shopkeeper brutal murders is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. In our first story from Bermondsey, it is July 1872. The squires a mother and daughter team who have run a stationery shop in the area for the last five or six years appear to have disappeared as a young boy pops into the shop. Finally, noticing blood, he peers over the counter and is shocked to see the elder Mrs. Squire lying in a pool of blood, bludgeoned to death. From initial appearances, the case is one of brutal robbery. What is surprising is that it is midday on a busy street and the bodies are still warm. From the Times, Thursday, July the 11th, 1872. Double murder at Hoxton. Yesterday afternoon it was found that two murders had been committed at 46 Hyde Road, Hoxton. The victims being a mother and daughter named Squires, aged respectively 76 and 48, who have for some time past carried on business as stationers at the above address. It seems that the two women lived alone in the house, which was a leasehold property belonging to the mother, and the shutters were taken down as usual yesterday morning by the daughter, who were seen outside the shop at various times between 9 and 11 o'clock, one person stating positively that he saw the mother standing at the, her door as late as 12.30. Be that as it may, at about 1.30 p.m. a little boy went into the shop to purchase a newspaper and seeing no one there lent his arms upon the counter waiting till he could be served when he observed blood and hair upon the counter and sprinkled over the papers. He rushed out of the house into the coffee shop next door and told the proprietress what he had seen. The latter forthwith proceeded to the house and, looking over the counter, saw the bodies of the two women, dreadfully mutilated, lying in a pool of blood. The police were communicated with and Mr. Hawthorne, a surgeon, pronounced life in each case to be extinct. On arrival of Inspector Ramsey of the N Division of the Metropolitan Police, a minute examination was made of the premises. Mrs. Squires lay behind the, the counter with her head frightfully battered and resting on her right arm, while the daughter was found with her head dreadfully injured, lying in the shop parlour, her body in the room and her legs towards the shop. The whole of the drawers and boxes had been broken open and ransacked, evidently with the intention of robbery. In several rooms the furniture was out of place. A clock which stood in the parlour had been knocked down or otherwise moved from the peg on which it usually hung and as it had stopped at twelve o'clock and was in good order 
and wound up, the presumption is that the murders were committed at that time. The murderer evidently used some heavy, blunt instrument, such as a hammer or iron bar, but no trace of the weapon has as yet been discovered, notwithstanding a minute search by the police. It was stated in the last night's evening papers that a lunatic brother of the younger victim was seen at or near 46 Hyde Road yesterday morning. It has been ascertained, however, that this man had been confined in the lunatic ward of the Shoreditch workhouse, and that he had not left the building the whole day, and that he would receive no benefit from the death of his mother. There seems to be little doubt that robbery was the object, but the police stated late last night that they suspected no one as yet and had no clue. The case has been placed in the hands of two experienced detectives. From the position in which the bodies were found, it is believed that the elder woman was first attacked and knocked down, and that as the daughter ran to her mother's assistance, she was met on the threshold of the room and instantaneously killed. Up to a late hour last night, no clue, as far as we could learn, had been obtained. The bodies now lie at the parish mortuary to await the coroner's inquest, which will be held tomorrow afternoon by Mr. Humphreys. Police are flummoxed, with very few clues to go on. The family itself seems to have been in turmoil, with much hard feelings between various members. One of the first to be suspected is Mrs. Squire's son, Francis Squire. Francis is living in the Shoreditch workhouse, and suspicion falls on his having committed the murders for the money. But this avenue is quickly negated. From the Globe, the 11th of July, 1872, the double murder at Hoxton. We have today been able to learn a few further particulars of the murder of Mrs. Squires and her daughter, that were then detailed in the special edition of the Globe last night, and which are reprinted in another column today. The perpetrator has not been found. It is stated by a neighbour that an attempt was made by some persons to enter the house on Sunday night, but that they were disturbed. Last evening the bodies were placed in two shells and conveyed to the Shoreditch dead house. It is stated that both the deceased and her daughter, who had resided for many years in the Hyde Road, were quiet and inoffensive persons. A man named Chalkley has today come forward and stated that he saw a man run hastily out of the shop at one o'clock yesterday afternoon, cross the Hyde Road and disappear down the turning opposite and he has been summoned to give evidence before the coroner tomorrow. The bodies will be identified by Mr. Edwin James Pritchard, the eldest son of the deceased by a former husband. The relatives of the victims this morning stated as their conviction that no person owed any malice or grudge towards the deceased, and that the murders have been deliberately planned and carried out for the sake of plunder. It is known that the elder deceased had a cash box in which she kept her money and whenever she gave change to a customer was in the habit of placing the box upon the counter and exhibiting the contents. This morning the post-mortem examinations of the bodies of the deceased women were made by Dr. Hawthorne and assisted by Dr. Forbes. The inquest will be opened tomorrow afternoon before the coroner for Middlesex at the Green Man Tavern in Hoxton Street, Shoreditch, at three o'clock precisely. This afternoon the police examined the house at 46 Hyde Road, Hoxton, where Mrs Squires and her daughter were murdered.
they discovered a will made by Mrs. Squires in favour of her two remaining daughters and her two living sons. No money was found in the house, nor upon the bodies of the deceased women. Hence, the supposition is that the murders were committed for the purpose of robbery. We have been requested to state that Francis Squire, the son of the deceased against whom suspicion was first cast, was in no way connected with the crime. He has been in a state of great poverty owing to illness and misfortune, and he states that owing to that cause he was compelled to enter the Shoreditch workhouse, where he is still remaining, and has been visited by the family solicitor in reference to the will and the property. His solicitor states that he is deeply pained at hearing of the death of his mother and sister, and remarked, it is bad enough to have them murdered, but it is worse to be called their murderer. He is of perfectly sound mind, and the workhouse officials state he never left the workhouse for six weeks preceding the crime. He had, some months ago, been at Colney Hatch Asylum, but he was discharged as cured. The investigation goes nowhere. There are some claims of having seen a grey-haired man fleeing the scene, but nothing comes from this lead. Mrs. Squire, the elder, was said to have been clutching grey hairs in her hand. Family members are all ruled out as suspects. From the Globe, the 13th of July, 1872, the Hoxton Horror. The police have telegraphed to the police stations throughout the country an account of the murder, which says the murder is supposed to have taken place at half past eleven o'clock in the forenoon. The murderer or murderers are unknown at present, but their clothes must have been saturated with blood. The weapon supposed to have been used in committing the murders is a plasterer's hammer, which was carried away. Up to this afternoon, however, the police had not succeeded in effecting an arrest. The government have offered a reward of £100 for the apprehension of the perpetrator of the murders of Mrs Squire and her daughter. It is stated that yesterday morning the police received intelligence of a person who for a long time has not been heard of, who was supposed to be dead, who knew the habits of the deceased, and who for a long time has pursued a disgretable course of life. A report has been made by a wagoner who states that he saw a man running from Mrs. Squire's house about the time of the murder, but although the most active measures are being taken for the detection of the criminal, he has now three days' start. Meanwhile, the impact of the investigations into the family as possible suspects, along with the social taint involved, leaves one family member to suicide. From the Globe, the 16th of July, 1872. Daughter Suicide. The eldest daughter of Mrs. Squire, who was murdered in the Hyde Road, Hoxton, on Wednesday last, has committed suicide. Since the affair in Hyde Road, she had been in a melancholy condition, but added to the grief occasioned by the murder of her mother, there appear to have been family differences, and it is said that she had previously attempted to lay violent hands on herself. The inquest takes place with all of the leads and testimony outlined to the coroner and the jury. The injuries sustained by mother and daughter were brutal, and believed to have been made with a plasterer's hammer. From the Globe, the 16th of July, 1872, the inquest. The elder Mrs. Squire had nine head wounds, with some blows having penetrated to the root of the brain, which was exposed by the force of the injuries. The upper portion of the skull had been broken into small pieces. 
There were other wounds over her right eye and right ear. The shape of the wounds led him to believe that they had been caused by a hammer, similar to a plasterer's hammer. The daughter, Christiana, had received fifteen wounds, with the skin forced from the skull on all wounds. Her skull was equally fractured in a similar way to her mother. As the inquiry continues, it is established that the squires had had a break-in the previous week from the back of the house. The jury returned a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown, adding that in their opinion the police had used every exertion in the matter, and they believed that they would continue to do so. With no viable leads, and despite the reward being increased to £200, the police are unable to trace anyone who could have committed the crime. The squires, mother and daughter, remain a cold case that was never solved. From the Times, Saturday, July the 20th, 1872, the ghastly story now slowly unravelling itself at the coroner's court at Hoxton is rich in horrors. The ferocity of the murderer appears to have been united with a business-like method which appalls while it compels attention. In addition, a certain mystery about the life of the victims, hardly less than about their death, exercises an unwholesome fascination over the public mind. A hundred wild theories are being concocted daily to explain the crime, nor can we wonder at the ingenuity which dwells on the details of the murder and invents emulous and equally elusive interpretations of the facts. At the present moment, the supply of horrors may be thought fully equal to the demand. Some, however, of the most notable are scarcely ripe for consideration. The elements which at once repel and attract in the Hoxton murders may satisfy the most ardent lover of sensation. The audacity of the criminal in attempting a deed of violence so desperate in an open shop in a public street and at noonday has indeed sometimes though rarely been paralleled. Nor is the mystery which surrounds the event great than envelopes some other famous murders. It is the combination of audacity with the apparent success in escaping which gives an exceptional interest to this attack on two lonely and helpless women. From the unsolved brutal murder of mother and daughter shopkeepers, squires, we jump to 1903 and the horrific murders of the Derby family. This case, known as the Essex Leighton Mystery, starts as a simple assault against an older man, but quickly unravels into a gruesome triple murder. Like many serial killer stories, it is the last crime which helps to unfold the many previous killings. Edwards attempts to kill a gentleman who is selling a property. The gentleman escapes, screaming murder, and police are called in. What appears to be a simple assault case rapidly unfolds into a case far more sinister. From the Bristol Times and Mirror, Wednesday 31st of December 1902, a latent mystery. Gentlemen attacked in an empty house. Three bodies discovered. A correspondent at Leighton in Essex reports that yesterday an elderly gentleman went to view a house in Church Road, and while doing so was, it is alleged, attacked by the man in charge with an iron bar. His screams attracted the neighbours, and the police who were called broke into the house and found the old man bleeding from his head. He had to be removed to the hospital. The caretaker was arrested, charged with assault and remanded. In consequence of suspicions, a police inspector 
had the garden of the house dug up, with the result, it is stated, that the bodies of three were found buried, but how they came there is at present a mystery. The Darby Family It all begins with a seemingly innocent newspaper advertisement, catching the attention of a man named Edwards, recently released from prison. The words beckoned him to 22 Wyndham Street, a grocer's shop, nestled within the tranquil streets of this South London borough. Eager to seize the opportunity, Edwards presented himself to the proprietor, John William Darby, who was accompanied by his devoted wife, Beatrix. His visit, which took place in the early days of December in 1902, unfolded with an air of amiability. Edwards, with a veneer of sincerity, expressed his conviction that the shop before him was exactly what he was looking for. He assured the Darbys that he wanted to buy the property as soon as possible and that he had the funds to do so. He then callously murdered all three. On a temporary basic, he hides all three bodies in the attic while he figures out what to do with them. Edwards temporarily hires a manager to run the shop, and whilst Edwards spends the time depleting the Derby household of all their goods, including their furniture. The murder plan. The murder had clearly been planned out. Recently released prisoner Edgar Edwards, 34, would find family-owned businesses, kill the family, hide their remains, and run their businesses for a few months whilst stealing their possessions, and then resell the business and do the same thing again to a different family business. The murder weapon came from the weight system sash windows of the time. Once Edwards had committed the callous murders of the Darby family, he next found himself confronted with the ominous task of concealing their lifeless forms. With a calculated resolve, he secreted their bodies away in a concealed chamber above the shop. Unbeknownst to the unsuspecting shop manager, a certain Mr Goodwin and his wife, who for several days dutifully presided over the business, the grisly secret lay dormant above them. Having extracted all the goods of the Darby family, on the 10th of December, Edwards explained to his recently hired manager that he was going to sell the shop. In order to sell the shop, the bodies which had been dumped above the shop had to be disposed of. Edwards took the opportunity to cut the bodies up, place them into Hessian sacks, and relay them to Leighton House, and bury them in the backyard. He took all of their furnishing, their crockery, many of their personal items, such as clothes, and even their dog, as his own, and transported it all to his newly acquired Leighton home. From the Manchester Evening News, the 1st of January, 1903. Gruesome discovery in Essex. Supposed triple murder, bodies buried in garden. An extraordinary and shocking discovery, which, according to present indications, points to the commission of triple murder, was made yesterday afternoon in Church Road, Leighton in Essex. About one month ago, a man named Edgar Edwards, aged 34, by occupation a grocer, became the tenant of the house in Church Road, and taking possession of the premises, he took with him several large boxes. Shortly afterwards, he had the back garden dug up, in order, as he said, to lay out flower beds. In some way he became acquainted with an old man, and about a week ago, when Edwards and the old man were in the former committed assault on his elderly acquaintance, which was of such a violent character 
that information was given to the police and Edwards was arrested. He was brought up before the magistrate at the Stratford Police Court in the ordinary course and remanded into custody while the circumstances of the assault were being investigated. There is considerable shock by the police to find gruesomely mutilated bodies in his backyard. Attempts are made to quickly identify the victims. From the Western Daily Press, the 1st of January 1903, a latent mystery, gruesome discovery. The mysterious discovery made at Leighton, when three mutilated bodies were found buried in a garden, was to some extent elucidated yesterday by the identification of the victims and a man named Edgar Edwards is charged with causing their deaths. The circumstances of the tragedy extend over a period of about two months, but only during the past few days have the police become possessed of information justifying them in charging Edwards. The prisoner was charged at Stratford Police Court on Christmas Eve with committing a violent assault on an elderly man named John Garland of Leytonstone by striking him on the head with a piece of iron. And whilst the accused was under remand, police investigations revealed a terrible story. The names of the persons who are supposed to have been murdered are William John Darby, aged 38, Beatrice Darby, his wife, aged 28, and their baby, aged three months. They were respectably connected and kept a shop at Wyndham Road in Camberwell, which they were supposed to have sold to Edwards about the middle of November when they suddenly disappeared. Edwards then took up residence there until early December, when he moved to 39 Church Road, Leighton, and buried in the back garden of which the mutilated bodies were discovered. Edwards was assisted with the Wyndham Road business by a sort of handyman, and subsequently he and Edwards were seen to drive a covered van to the shop, lift into it some furniture and a couple of boxes supposed to contain crockery ware and drive away. Since then, the Camberwell business has been closed. A few days previously, a man named Rawlins had been engaged to dig at the back garden at Leighton House, and he assisted in unloading the furniture and the boxes. From the time of the disappearance of the Darbys, their friends felt that all was not well, and communicated with the police. When Edwards was in custody and his house searched, neighbours told of strange happenings in the garden and the outcome was the discovery of the bodies. In the upstairs rooms were clothing belonging to Mr and Mrs Darby. A small dog formerly belonging to Mrs Darby was also found in Edwards' possession and, it was said, was continually smelling around the spot where his master and mistress were buried and would not move away. The officers also found a letter purporting to be a reference from Mr Darby to a house agent of whom Edwards took the house at Leighton. The bodies, when discovered, presented a shocking sight. They were tied in half a dozen sacks. The heads, arms and legs had been severed, but, although decomposed, were identified by the deceased's relatives. On searching the premises at Wyndham Road, the police discovered evidence of bloodshed, while on the floor, wrapped in paper, was a window sash weight with blood marks on it. An old, rusty saw was also found, which had been handed to an analyst. The appearance of the room indicated that it had recently been washed. The Darbys had been in the Wyndham Road business about twelve months, but 
as it was not satisfactory, advertised it for sale, and Edwards entered into negotiations. From the Western Daily Press, the 1st of January, 1903, a latent mystery. Gruesome discovery. The bodies were those of a man aged about 25 years, a woman apparently about the same age, and the third, the body of a baby about three months old. The head, the arms and legs of both man and woman had been severed, and the skulls of both showed palpable signs of having been struck with some heavy instrument. The baby had a handkerchief tied tightly round its neck, and death in its case was evidently due to strangulation. The three bodies were removed to the local mortuary, and the police are pursuing their investigation. Edwards at the time had only been held on the charge of assault. He believed he had gotten away with the Derby killings and was unconcerned until he entered the dock. From the Western Daily Press, the 1st of January 1903, Police Court Proceedings, a grocer in the dock. At Stratford Police Court today, Edgar Edwards, 34, grocer of Church Road, was charged on remand with unlawfully and maliciously wounding John Garland by striking him on the head with a piece of iron and inflicting grievous bodily harm on the 23rd of December. There was, however, brought against him a further charge which ran as follows, that he did feloniously kill and slay William John Darby, aged 26, Beatrice Darby, his wife, aged 28, and Ellen Beatrice Darby, aged three months, on or about the 28th of November at 22 Wyndham Road, Camberwell. As soon as the charge had been read in court, the prisoner exclaimed to the magistrate, Sure, sir, there is some great mistake. Detective Inspector Collins stepped into the witness box and said that as the charge was now one of murder, he asked that the prisoner be remanded on the original charge, that of wounding, so that the whole of the facts might be laid before the public prosecutor. The bodies, said the inspector, were found buried in a garden of a house occupied by the prisoner, and evidence would be adduced that furniture and effects belonging to the deceased were found in that house. The inspector added that the bodies were cut into eight pieces and were in six sacks. The child appeared to have been strangled by something tied round its neck, and a blood-stained weapon was discovered in the house. Mr Chapman, the magistrate, remanded the prisoner, who was at once removed. With the evidence of the neighbour's evidence, the freshly murdered cut-up bodies in the backyard of his newly acquired house, blood evidence with the upstairs of the shop, Edgar's ownership of the known Derby dog, personal items known to have belonged to the Derby family, and the possession of the bloody rusty saw that had been used to dismember the family. The case against Edwards was strong, and he was remanded for trial. The Trial the trial was begun on the 12th of February. From the onset, Edward's behaviour was marked as strange. He regularly interrupted proceedings with comments or just plainly refused to answer. From the Daily News in London, the 13th of February, 1903, the Leighton Horror, Trial of Edgar Edwards, Prisoner's Strange Conduct. Mr Justice Wright yesterday commenced the trial at the Old Bailey of Edgar Edwards, aged 34, a tall, powerfully built man, described in the calendar as a clerk on indictments charging him with having willfully murdered William John Beatrice and Ethel Darby at Camberwell and with having attempted to murder John Garland at the house at Church Road, Leighton, the garden of which 
the mutilated bodies of the Darbys were found buried. The particular count of the indictment which the case was tried was that charging the willful murder of William John Darby, but the whole of the facts were opened by counsel. The prisoner was brought into the dock in charge of three warders and accompanied by Dr. Scott, the prison surgeon. He remained standing throughout the trial, but repeatedly interrupted the proceedings and passed a number of memoranda to his solicitor and counsel. On being called by the clerk of arraigns, Mr. Avery, to say whether he was guilty or not guilty of the willful murder of William John Darby, the prisoner refused at first to reply. He then exclaimed, I don't want any nonsense. The clerk of arraigns again asked the question, and the prisoner refused to answer. The clerk then added, You hear what I say? Edwards responded, You have no business to ask me such questions. The clerk of arraigns said, You must answer yes or no. Edwards replied, Stuff and nonsense. Mr. Justice Wright thereupon directed a plea of not guilty to be entered, and the trial proceeded. Evidence is put forward regarding the pawning of Darby's items. The digging of the garden, which was a scene by the neighbours from their windows, and his negotiations with John Garland, the older gentleman who managed to escape the attack that Edgar had instigated on him. From the Daily News in London, the 13th of February, 1903, the attack on Garland. When Garland was about to leave, Edwards attacked him from behind with a sash weight wrapped in paper, striking him a murderous blow to the head. Fortunately, Garland did not lose his senses. He struggled with the prisoner and eventually got out of the door and raised an alarm. As the police arrived, Edwards was found locked in a bedroom, changing his clothes, which were covered with blood. Water in a bath was found tinged with red. Edwards said he was attacked and that he had struck back with the first thing that came to his hand. Edwards was arrested. The discovery of the bodies in the hole in the garden. In dismembering the bodies, a saw had been used. In the house at Camberwell, there were various bloodstains upon the walls and upon a table. This completed the story of one of the most gruesome crimes ever placed before the court, and counsel invited the jury upon these facts to say that the prisoner was guilty of willful murder. The motive, he suggested, having been to get possession of the business and property of the murdered man. Darby was murdered by means of a sash weight, and Edwards was found in possession of that weight. Edwards was easily found guilty of the murders and was sentenced to execution. Whilst awaiting his execution, Edwards was sent to Wandsworth Prison, where he was considered a difficult prisoner. From a Stockton Herald, South Durham and Cleveland Advertiser, 21st of February, 1903. Reported Confession Edwards has maintained his sullen, vengeful manner. He spent the night at Brixton after his condemnation in cursing and raving. When received at Wandsworth on Saturday morning, he refused absolutely to receive the chaplain or to listen to his prayers. He spent the day yesterday in pacing the narrow confines of his cell like a wild animal, and he railed at his guards and caused them to move about as much as possible. The task of guarding Edwards is a trying one. He cannot be punished for any of his actions in the cell or pinioned down to prevent them. As a condemned man, he has considerable latitude. He can see as many friends as he chooses and as often as he chooses, and he can order anything he likes to eat or drink. Edwards is said to have made a confession which is in the hands of his solicitor.
The question of Edward's actual sanity came up several times, as attempts were made to have his sentence remanded to life in prison in Broadmoor. There had been several cases of insanity in his family line, but ultimately this attempt failed. From the Sheerness Times Guardian, the 28th of February 1903, Edgar Edwards Sane, specialist find no grounds for a respite of the Leighton murderer. The two specialists who were ordered to inquire into the mental condition of Edgar Edwards, the fiend in human form, whose victims the Derby family were found buried in a Leighton garden, have completed their report. It has been forwarded to the Home Office, and it is understood that the medical men have not been able to discover anything that would justify the Home Secretary in advising His Majesty to respite the sentence of death. On the 3rd of March, 1903, Edgar Edwards was hung. From the Sheffield Daily Telegraph, the 4th of March, 1903, the execution of Edwards. Edgar Edwards was executed at Wandsworth Jail, London, yesterday morning, for the horrible murder of Mr. and Mrs. Darby and their infant child on December the 1st last at Camberwell. His last words, distinguishable to those standing by, were, Good Lord, have mercy upon me. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays, Fatal Transactions, when the cash register rings death. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We are passionate about historical crime and do our best to present interesting cases from long ago that go beyond the usual fare. For our listeners and subscribers, thank you. We so very much appreciate the many supporters and subscribers who have helped us to build this channel. The News of the Times team all appreciate each of you for your help. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century, and encompasses men, women, children, and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories of a similar theme, such as stories of murders by starvation. And Fridays are frightful with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known, grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.